Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India once again and as promised we would start discussing the notion of tangent cones today. In the last class if we go back to what I have said then you would observe that we ended up with this sort of Karush Kuntaka necessary and sufficient condition. I have proved the necessary part and you, you can uh, prove the sufficient part yourself by employing the definitions of convexity of f and g and the affineness of this class of constraints A x equal to b. So, we have said that a major role here has been played by an object called closer of the cone of a convex set mine translated to a point x bar. So, basically what happens is that that sort of cone has a particular geometric structure the closer of the cone of. So, if you take a convex hull of c we saw that we were this cone had played an important role actually you know you, you take any set C a convex set like this and you want to generate a cone that is take any element and take every element of C and pass rays through the origin through those points. So, basically at the end you would end up with something like this. So, if this set is closed then of course, you will have for example, if, if uh, this king point is not on the convex set C then the resulting cone would not be closed. So, this is what is the cone or maybe cone generated by the set C. C minus x bar means you have taken a point x bar and then you are uh, doing C minus x bar. So, 0 becomes a part of the cone Basic, basically you translate the cone where what the position of x bar is now taken up by the point 0. So, origin becomes a part of this. So, you make this translation c minus x bar where x bar is some element here. This particular cone or the particular cone that you will now see coming out of this has for a convex set has some meaning. For example, if it is c minus x bar where x bar is not in the inside, but it is in one of the boundaries like here, then you you would actually get a cone like this sorry you get a set like this this is your c minus x bar and then at the point 0 you are trying to draw some sort of closed convex cone. So, now this has linked with the notion of the tangent cone or the bulligand tangent cone, bulligand contingent cone. So, it was uh, discovered in 1938 by introduced in 1938 by bulligand for very different purpose not for optimization, but it has certainly uh, come to play a important role in optimization. So, if you look at uh, the very basic notion of a tangent which you have learned in high school is that if you have a curve like this on the Cartesian plane then you take two points p and q and if you want to draw a tangent to this curve at p. So, tangent is a line that touches the curve only at the point p the tangent at p and does not touch at any other point. So, what you essentially do is to you join these chords p q and then take this succession of points coming towards p. So, you basically then start joining p with those succession of points and finally, you end up with a line like this that is your limit. So, that is your tangent. Now, this is the tangent to a curve. What about the tangent to 
a convex set. So, what do you mean by tangent to a convex set? So, in this case the notion of tangency here you see here you are talking about a smooth movement from q to p, but what about if the set is discrete or means just some few points can you talk about a tangent to it. Of course, here we are considering convex sets we need not bother about all those things. So, if you look at this picture once again of this c minus x bar and I am trying to draw a cone generated by this c minus x bar. If you see all these lines are some sort of tangents. So, the tangent cone to c at x bar. So, consider a convex set c. C and then V element of R n is a tangent to C at x bar if there exists a sequence. This symbol is a short form for the word there exists a sequence v k of vectors going to v and lambda k which is real numbers going down to 0 that is they are all positive going down to 0 such that x bar plus lambda k v k. So, any vector v which satisfies this property would be called a tangent to the set c at x bar. Now, uh, observe that here this when I am having a real sequence my uh, sequencing that is my indexing is on the bottom and when I am talking about a vector sequence here my indexing is at on the, on the top. So, this can have an equivalent definition that okay, a vector v element of R n is tangent if there exists x k sequence x k converging to x bar and lambda k converging to 0 such that x k minus x bar by lambda k converges to v. See this also comes from this fact when both of these are equivalent you can check it out. If you look at this diagram the idea is actually built in here the tangent to a curve that when the difference when x k the sequence is coming to x bar. So, if this is x bar the sequence is coming down to x bar then there would be a lambda k which controls it. So, it does not just become this thus vector does not become 0, but it is controlled. So, its direction it is controlled by lambda k in such a way that ultimately the limit of these vectors are pointing in a certain direction. So, if you have a tangent if you have any set here I will assume that okay, this set for example, this nice looking convex set C. So, then what is the tangent? Of course, there are two curves. So, you draw these two curves, but I can talk about any sequence coming to this point in C. So, what, what is important is this x k must be in C and I am looking at these differences x k minus x bar x k minus x bar and then modulating it with lambda. So, these vectors that will be generated by other sequences in C, they can be now thought of as a tangent vector. May not necessarily be thought of as a tangent vector those who are more akin one more uh, habituated with the school geometry coordinate geometry might be having a little bit of problem, but let me tell you that in convex geometry or the geometry of optimization everything is one sided because convexity is one sided because you use an inequality and as a result of which your geometry is not both sided like the tangent here your geometry here is also one sided. So, this if you look at it I can call the set of all these vectors they form a cone 
and that is called the tangent cone to V at x bar to C at x bar the tangent cone. And so, set of all V's form this set of set which is called which is a cone and which we call the tangent cone. Now, when C is convex, see this can be defined for any set C, but here we are gluing ourselves to a convex set because essentially we are talking about convex optimization. So, rather than complicating the facts of life, it is essential that we just concentrate on the things at hand, the things that we really are interested in that is of minimizing a convex function over a convex set. Now, if you look at this uh, thing, the question is and if you see the pictures that we have drawn of tangents, this tangent here, this can be proved that try this as homework or I will show it to you tomorrow. So, if C is a convex set, the tangent cone has a beautiful and clear expression. So, what is this tangent cone useful for? That is the first question. So, a tangent cone is useful possibly in using its for its use in optimality condition. Now, you might say that okay, how many optimality conditions you are going to use because you know optimality conditions we have been studying from the beginning, but you know optimization largely is story of uh, finding optimality conditions that would lead you to compute the points. Now, you have already seen the normal cone. Of course, the tangent cone has some relationship with the normal cone and the optimality conditions gets you know redressed as you change from normal to tangent cone. If we go back to our story, you will see that with the normal cone, the sub differential is involved or sub differential itself is involved with the normal cone 0 belongs to del f x naught plus uh, the normal cone or 0 element of grad f x plus normal cone. The directional derivative is associated with the tangent cone. So, the tangent cone geometry is expressed with the directional derivative and the normal cone geometry is expressed with the gradient or the sub differential itself. So, there is some sort of duality between these two things normal cone and tangent cone. So, the duality involved in these expressions is also expressed by the tangent cone and normal cone and these dual relations will come very soon, but let us see what the tangent cone can do. Now, uh, there is another interesting way to look at the tangents, the notion of tangency, how can you arrive at such a notion of tangency? So, uh, we are studying optimization, so we are essentially talking about variation. That is, if I want to say that some x bar is actually a minima, then I should be able to say how it is varying with respect to other points. That is, if I am talked having a point x bar here and I want to say that this is a minimum, at then if I move a bit away from x bar and still be in C, say I have this direction w and this new point is x bar plus some lambda w, if this is a minimum I should always for a function f I, I guess then this must always be true. Now, the important thing is that the direction that I am choosing has to be of this form that x bar plus lambda w must be in the set C. So, this 
So, lambda of w must be in the set c minus x bar. Say I take lambda to be positive, of course, I am moving along this direction, so it is positive. So, because lambda is positive, this is element of 1 by lambda times. So, this simply says that w is element of closure of the cone of, of course, in the cone and hence in the closure. So, any w for which I can measure this change, this variation that is f of x bar plus lambda w minus f x bar. I am measuring this variation. So, if x bar is the minimum, so moving along those directions which will keep these new points, these points in the set C would actually should give me this difference to be greater than or equal to 0. So, this is the variation that we are trying to measure. So, but over which points, in, along which directions I should measure the variations, those directions should belong to the tangent cone. So, the very notion of variation which is very, very fundamental optimization that is the very basic definition of what you mean by an optima is intimately linked with the notion of tangent cone. And hence, it is important that we have some time to see how this idea is linked with optimization in the sense of how it is linked with optimality conditions. Now, suppose I have chosen this w over this for this convex function, this w from the tangent and then what I am having is that if x bar is a minima, then Actually, if you observe, I can remove this by x minus x bar, I can take any x here and do x minus x bar and if I move along those directions x minus x bar or lambda x minus x bar, this will be actually true. So, what would happen if I apply differentiability property of this, I will simply get so this is my optimality condition. And in fact, if the function f is not differentiable, then the directional derivative in the direction x bar, say in the at the point x bar in the direction w must be greater than 0 for every w. Now, this is a, a very, very important fact that you must note, this is an important fact. So, here you see how the tangent cone is playing a role, then what is its link with the normal cone? So, are we having two different optimality conditions? Can we move from one of these to the other? Can we from here, can I come from here to this condition? If this or this replaced with the sub differential. So, can I can I can I come to such conditions? See this uh, thing uh, would require some more more tours into the land of convex analysis. Uh, convexity is so fundamental, but but so intrinsically beautiful that uh, Never mind, even if you are engineers who are in the audience or maybe people from management sciences who just want to plug in and get the answer and declare a non optimal point as an optimal one, can also take some pleasure from the beauty of this subject. I would like to emphasize that when I say that you are pushing a button and tell pull telling a non optimal point as optimal it is not with an intention to ridicule anyone. The intention is clear that most people who practice optimization, at least in India in my country, hardly really know the mathematics behind optimization and 
unless you are aware of the mathematics behind optimization, it is not really possible to appreciate or really know what algorithm to use on what sort of problem and when I would stop an algorithm. See, it is very, very important to know at the very outset, because what happens is that you would just have a problem, you would have some MATLAB, F mean con something, you will put in your problem and they will throw an answer and you would accept it and possibly declare it as your solution, your optimal point. The very important fact that you should uh, learn when you study optimization and I want to stress it again, if you read Yuri Nesterov's book, Introductory Lectures on Convex Optimization, this is what he writes in the very beginning that optimization problems in general are not solvable. Of course, you can solve toy problems like minimizing x square over whole r or minimizing uh, f x equal to x when x is in r between minus 1 and plus 1, these are toy problems, but real problems. When I am talking about optimization problems, I am talking about real problems. It is a quadratic optimization problem, you just cannot solve it. Um, if a real quadratic optimization problem with a large number of variables, large number of constants, it is not so easy to do. You cannot just, you just cannot solve it. If even if it is a convex problem, you what you get is an approximate answer unless there are very special structures or very, very special situation. So, they are not solvable in general. Then what is the need to study optimization? Uh, am I not to find the actual minimum? Then what? Is, how do I? How do I solve my problem? You say minimize this, 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 and you just say that oh, you can't find the minimizer. So why are you wasting all this time speaking about optimality condition, etc.? Theory, by the way, is always naive in the sense that there are a lot of assumptions. We assume a perfect world for a perfect theory, but the real world is not so perfect, so your theory is only a guiding tool to tell you how good is the approximation that you have taken. So, what do you take at the end of running algorithms in is, is an approximation. How good is your approximation is what theory will tell you. How does your point satisfy the Karush Kuntakar condition at least, or how how far is it from the Karush Kuntakar actual Karush Kuntakar solution? So, these are the things which makes the th makes learning of the theory important whether you are engineer or in management science or something else or of course, for mathematics or in you are, you are in computer science. So, we will come into algorithms very soon not I will not say very soon, but maybe in few more lectures, but we will give an extensive time on algorithms. But it is very, very important to understand at the very outset that theory is always guiding you to do to generate those algorithms. Now, once I have done this, let us see. So, in order that you go back and forth between two different types of optimality conditions, one expressed in terms of tangent cone and directional derivative, another expressed in terms of uh, the gradient or the sub differential and the normal cone, you need to know a bit about the notion of a polar cone. So, let k be a closed convex cone. I do not need a closed convex cone to give a general definition of a polar, but our cones are essentially closed and convex in most cases. So, we just assume that fact. Then the polar of k that of all x in R n such that x times w is less than equal to 0 for all w in k. 
So, if that is my definition, then let me take the simplest example R 2 plus. So, take any w in k R 2 plus, take any w here. I want all those vectors v which will make an obtuse angle with this, that is angle has to be more than 90 degrees. So, the all points here will all the vectors here in this third quadrant will form an obtuse angle. If you take some vector here, it will form an acute angle, any vector here will form an acute angle. So, essentially if I write R 2 plus the positive orthend, non negative orthend and take its polar, it is nothing but the minus of R 2 plus. Suppose you take any cone like this, so you have to find points which will make obtuse angle, it cannot make acute angle. You take any point here, it is making obtuse angle, take any point here, it is making obtuse angle. Here again for this particular cone where I have halved the, I have just drawn a line and rubbed the other part, it is still again minus or 2 plus. So, if you take the this as k, then this is again k polar. Then I must just look and ask this question, what is the polar of the polar? It is just a curious question, nothing much to worry about. So, if I define it, this consists all w in R n such that w times x is less than or equal to 0 for all x in k polar, that is the definition. I am just repeating the definition removing k with k polar, that is all. That means that I am asking the question what is this? The interesting fact is that k polar polar is equal to k polar polar is equal to k. That is the interesting thing. So, how do you do the proof? The proof needs separation theorem. So, try this as homework. Tomorrow I am almost going to take an assignment class by trying to show that the tangent cone is that and also try to prove this one. Now, why am I telling you all this story of polar and all these things? Does it uh, have any relationship with the our subject at hand, tangent cone, normal cones and optimization? The interesting fact is this. If you take the polar, take the polar of the tangent cone, you come up with the normal cone. That is not that fascinating that you just the geometry, you just have to look at to the, in, look into the geometry. The, so, these two things are so geometrically linked that this is a set of all vectors v which makes obtuse angle with the elements of the tangent cone. And now you take the normal cone, you take the polar of this which is polar of the closed and convex cone T c x bar. So, you take the polar of the polar and then by using this thing we get this is nothing but the tangent cone. This is quite interesting, but now my question would be how do I get back between two optimality conditions? For that we really have to wait a bit. Now, we were, once we have discussed all these optimality conditions, this sort of geometry that is involved in the whole discussion, let us get a bit bold 
and look into the structure of the convex functions still more in a more deta in a more detail. You look at a convex function you see uh, you look at this epigraph basically APF. Now, you have at every point of this closed convex set because I have drawn a continuous convex nice looking convex function and so it is finite valued. So, it is continuous and so at every point you are having a tangent uh, hyperplane a supporting hyperplane and you see what are these supporting hyperplanes. The supporting hyperplanes are defined by affine functions. So, basically you take any affine function which is lying below the graph of the convex function and then take some sort of a upper upper envelope of those collection of affine functions they would actually generate you the epigraph itself the fun convex function itself they will generate you the curve the graph of the function so what happens is that take take a convex function f this is f and then take a fine functions of this form such that f of x is equal to is greater than equal to h x for all x. So, here we are talking about affine functions we are not talking about something vertical we are not talking about a line like this which uh, talks about the then affine function x equal to 0. Right in, in the R2 space, it is the affine function x equal to 0. So, it is 1 0 into x y is equal to 0. So, we are not talking about these sort of uh, you know, I am, I am not talking about a line which tells which just gives you x equal to 0. I am talking about non vertical hyperplanes because if you have a vertical hyperplane, then it is cutting through the epigraph. So, once you are cutting through the epigraph, it is impossible to make this sort of assertions. So, you cannot cut through the epigraph, you have to be below the epigraph as a result of which you have to slant down because if you do not slant down if you are non vertical you cannot maintain this thing. So, you see what I have drawn is all these affine functions has their functional values at any point you take this affine function. The functional value is of f is here and the functional value of the affine one is here the functional value of f is here. So, this is always holding for this class. So, what I am trying to say is that you collect the set of all h which supports this. So, collect all affine h which support this that set is called support set of f is. So, it is a collection of all affine functions h which is minor which is majorized by f or which minorizes f in the sense that f is always bigger. Now, if you look at now the far, far reaching result in convex analysis which actually gives you a global structure of convex functions is the following. It tells you that a function if it is a continuous function like this if or if f is finite you always have with h belonging to support of f. So, what do you do? You take an x 
and you can compute at that x the values of all the h x's which are in this set and then take the supremum of all those values and that will exactly give you f x because you say you take a value here a one of the h x another h x another h x and you go up and you finally reach the graph. So, that is exactly what is, is the story. So, this is not only talk, talk, talks about the case when f is finite in fact, if f is extended valued proper and lower semi continuous, I have already told you what lower semi continuous is lower semi continuous, then this holds, but okay, we are not going to be so much bother about this lower semi continuous business, because that uh, is essentially a technical thing, but is a very helpful technical thing, but for our studies we can just be happy with continuous convex functions, because that is more or less the thing that you will handle in practice this useful device that we had just spoken about this useful result has interesting consequences. Now, let us look at this newly a new cons convex functions which we construct out of this very idea that if you take the supremum of functions majorized by a convex function that you can get back the convex function itself. So, if you take the envelope upper envelope of, of a family of affine functions what you get is a convex function. So, we are going to now define the Fenchel conjugate of a convex function. So, define a function f star which takes any element x star in R n, x star is in R n and you compute the value of this function as follows, take supremum of all x in R n Now, you see there are two ways to prove that this is a convex function. So, my first job is okay, of course, f is a convex function, you can prove that f star is convex without even f being convex, but okay, our case is just convex. Now, if you observe this, so what I am having is a family of affine functions for every fixed x this is an affine function in x star and by what we have just seen, by what we have just seen the upper envelope would provide us with a convex function. So, this is a convex function, but you can directly try compute it. So, f star is a convex function, one must be wondering why all this operations. Now, there is something interesting about this operation, let me look at f star 0. So, it is supremum x star is 0, so it is 0, I do not use this. So, this means the negative of the infimum of f x over r n.
So, this is a very, very fundamental fact, which means that if I have a finite infimum, then f star is a proper function. See, f star can never take the value infinity, because if you if f is a finite convex function, which we are taking, and you put any x star, then there will be you for a given x, these values are always finite. So, it will never take, the supremum cannot be minus infinity, because r n anyway is not non-empty. So, the supremum could be plus infinity, it could blow up the supremum, it. So, if the function f has a finite infimum, then you are guaranteed that this is a proper function, there will be at least one point which is 0, where the function is finite. But it can be prove that if you have a convex, if you have a finite function f, it would be any way of proper function. So, this f star is actually an extended valued function. But since f is finite, there exists at least one point where you have f star finite. So, f is a nice equative function, nice function which has a minimum over play x square, then f star 0 is 0. Okay. We will try to find the usefulness of this and in fact, tomorrow we will come with a, a repertoire of examples of f and f star and its implications of in optimization and this function has brought in a new area called computational convex analysis, which is a thriving area, which one might get interested, somebody in mathematics might just get interested by this whole thing or somebody who wants to work in the interface of math and its associated computations. So, uh, if you look at this, I am yet to give examples, I am not going to give examples today for this particular case f and f star pair. So, if you if you observe f star x by very definition is bigger than x star x minus f x for any x in R n. This would imply f star x star plus f of x is bigger than x star x. So, this is called the young fenchel inequality. You might think that there is no use giving this such a triviality a name, because it is just obvious from this definition. Yeah, it is obvious, but what is not so obvious is the fact that equality holds that is f star x star plus f of x is x star of x, if and only if x star belongs to the sub differential of f at x. So, if f is differentiable, then x star is exactly equal to the gradient of f at x. So, with this very basic introduction to the notion of conjugates, conjugates play a very important role, because when I had define a convex function f, a convex minimization problem or minimizing a convex function over a convex set, there is some other convex problem which is defined or other concave problem which is defined in terms of the negative of f star, which is called the dual problem which comes into play, which we will soon talk about a little later. Uh, and then uh, this is exactly uh, a very, very, very basic thing what we have done. So, tomorrow we are going to give examples and 
we are going to prove what we had said that we are going to prove k naught naught is k and let us see what we had given you in the homework. We have given you to prove this one. So, this is what the tangent cone when c is convex, this is what the tangent cone is. It follows from this definition will give you into this definition. And of course, we are going to prove this fact. But before we do so, we will give a repertoire of examples from our pair of f and f star. But now the question is what would happen if f is not just finite, it is extended valued but proper that it is finite at at least one point. So, then can you define this? The answer is yes, you can define it in a similar way and you can show that when f is proper that it has at least one finite value and it is never taking the minus infinity value, then f star is also a proper function. Because once we for example, the interesting question what happens if this is the indicator function of the set c, then what is the f star? So, we will try to figure out those things and they are pretty interesting. So, and has lot of linkages with optimality condition that we also uh, figure out tomorrow. So, with this we end today's talk, thank you very much.